tears or crying doesn't always indicate that something bad has happened or that something is wrong. Sometimes it can be, but sometimes it isn't. I remember crying one time when uh, one of my friends in college went down to the altar to take some of the hardships and difficulties that he was dealing with, that his parents were dealing with, to the altar. That was a good thing. That was a good thing. I, uh, I, also, I also have seen uh, the joy of a marriage proposal that can bring a woman or the man proposing to tears. I've seen that happen as well. Or, or when a parent uh, sees their child do something well. You know, we might, we, might, we might shed a tear over that because we're proud of them. But for Saul and Keon, they were brought to tears by a surprise thank you to them. Saul and Keon are garbage collectors who have never missed a day of work in Miami Beach. And they were especially glad to have their route the week uh, in June last year, the last week of one week in June last year, because a beautiful surprise awaited them. When they rolled their huge garbage truck down the street into the community, they found scores of the residents, the residents lining the streets up early to greet them, waiting to greet them with signs that simply said, thank you, we love you, thank you for what you've done for us. During the pandemic, resident Jennifer Elegant wanted to show the families, her family's appreciation, so she organized a socially distanced surprise thank you celebration to honor these two essential workers whom she called extraordinary. They went above and beyond in their service to the community. Uh, she said they, they uh, one, one example, Saul, Saul spent 45 minutes helping a neighbor dig through her trash to find a wedding ring. Uh, they also stood by one of the residents who, who was having heart trouble and waited for the ambulance to get there an hour long wait and, and, and make sure that they were okay. And so she wanted to make sure they knew they were, were appreciated. And so when they saw all these signs greeting them, saying, thank you and we love you, they were brought to tears. But it is also true, isn't it? The tears and loud cries and weeping also are produced by difficulties and hardships and pain and grief and loss. Tears are brought on by a whole range of human emotion and human experience. The believers in the book of Hebrews know something about the hardships, about the pain, about the losses, because they are being persecuted for their faith in Jesus. In fact, they are tempted to just pretend they're Jews only because the Jews weren't being persecuted. And they would just hide in their Jewish identity and play down or reject altogether their Christian faith. To make it through the persecution. To, to hide from and stay out of all the difficulties and the tears and crying that come along with it. And so the question being addressed is, will they? Will they? That's one of the questions. Will they reject Christ? And the author of Hebrews pleads with them not to do so. And he also addresses two underlying or implied questions that are related to that. To their circumstances and the trials that they face. And the questions are, can Jesus, the Son of God, really understand what they're going through? Can he really understand their turmoil? And secondly, what help is available to them in the midst of all of this? We find our text in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, and then we'll also look at chapter 5, 7 through 10 here in a moment. This is the word of the Lord. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The word of the Lord. One of the great themes of the book of Hebrews that uh, is first introduced in Hebrews chapter 2 is given further attention here. That Jesus is our great high priest. 
And the author wants to assure them that they have Jesus as a merciful and faithful high priest and that he can indeed sympathize with all that they're going through. That he can sympathize with their trials and weaknesses since he was tested by what he suffered just as they are now. And that he was tested in every respect that they have been. He wants to give them that assurance. And we know among the tests or the trials that Jesus faced included the temptations that he faced. In the wilderness, especially we think of, right? Where Satan tried to tempt him to proving he was the Son of God. Or to take a shortcut to glory and, and bypass the cross and suffering. He tempted Jesus to do that in the wilderness. But that's not the only time Jesus faced temptations and trials. In fact, in Luke's account, it says that Satan just left him for a more opportune time. And we know that he faced trials and temptations all throughout. Peter tried to tempt Jesus with that same thing that Satan did, right? He took Jesus aside and rebuked him and said, no, 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 the Messiah can't suffer and die, right? The Messiah can't, can't go through that kind of thing. You misunderstand Jesus tempted him to bypass the cross. Jesus also in Gethsemane faces the point of decision and struggle concerning the Father's will. Remember, he, he was pleading and, and sweat drops of blood from his face. He was in such distress and turmoil. And then even on the cross, remember, the people, the people disparaged him and derided him, and the chief priests and scribes did as well. And they tempted him to come down from the cross. He, they, they said to him, you saved others, why don't you save yourself and prove that you're the Son of God? But he never gives in to the temptations. Temptation's not sin. But giving in to the temptation is the sin. And Jesus never gave in to the temptation Jesus is without sin. Of course, his suffering itself as well is part of the tests and trials that Jesus endured and went through, right? And we and we we can bring to our minds all that Jesus went through um, during during this time that we're we're in right now, up up into leading to the cross. He uh, he he had Judas, one of his own disciples, who betrayed him. He had Peter who denied him three times. He had all the rest of the disciples desert him and left him by himself. He had the miscarriage of justice before the Jewish religious leaders who, who, uh, who condemned him and handed him over unjustly. He, he suffered humiliation before the shouting crowd and the mockery of the soldiers who slapped him in the face and spit in his face and dressed him up in robes like a king and mocked him. And then, of course, the severe flogging and the beating and the crucifixion on the cross, he faced it all. He knows what it's like to suffer. The Hebrews, these believers, are going through hard struggles with suffering of their own. Hebrews chapter 10, 32 through 35 says that they had already endured some kinds of hard struggles before, sometimes being publicly exposed to abuse and persecution, sometimes being partners with those so tested and treated. Some of them were in prison. Some of them had their possessions plundered because of the name of Christ. So here again, the author of Hebrews is reminding them that they've not only been through this before, but they are not the first ones to be hated by the world. Their Lord walked before them. The Lord walked in their shoes. He knows all about their struggles as we sang this morning. Jesus knows all about our struggles. Yes, that's what he's telling the Hebrew believers. He understands. He's able to sympathize with their weaknesses and ours. And ours. Dr. Hahn explains what that word sympathize means even, even more pointedly. He says the root of the meaning of the word means to feel with. That Christ is able to feel with us our feelings of weakness, fear, anxiety, insecurity, and being torn between choices that are complicated and difficult. He knows. 
He goes on to say, this should not be understood to me that Jesus experienced in identical fashion every specific temptation that any of us have experienced, rather that he experienced the full range of temptation, its full range of power, its full range of the areas in life in which temptation occurs. Someone might object, well, Jesus never sinned, so how could he truly understand our weakness? How can he truly understand since he didn't sin? The writer of Hebrews later answers that objection in Hebrews 12, 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood, but Jesus did. So he understands the pressures of temptation in a way that we never will. He understands it in a, in, a, in a way that we will never experience beyond what we experience now, in fact. So yes, Jesus truly understands and can sympathize all that we're going through, he tells them, and us. He understands. He understands and is able to sympathize with his brothers and sisters. And this is also the reason he is able to help them. He not just feels with them and understands, but he actually can help them. You see, one thing it's one thing to be able to sympathize. It's another thing to actually be able to offer real, tangible help in the midst of it. And the author of Hebrews says, both are true of Jesus. <laughs> Don't, aren't you glad that we serve a Savior who can help us? Not just provide salvation, which he has, but in every day help, he can help us. Every moment help, he can give us. That's the Savior that we serve, church. Oh, I wish you would be encouraged by that. I wish you would be smiling about that. I wish there might even be, Lord forbid, a amen about that. Jesus can help us. Jesus can help us. The word for help is used of a rope or chain that secures a vessel. We just went over in Acts 27, verse 17. The only other use of this word for help is found there in Paul's missionary journeys to Rome. It's used, remember the shipwreck where the, where the, uh, the, the, the sailors used a rope and undergirded the, the ship with the ropes to hold it together in the face of the storm? That's the word for help. That's the word for help that we have in Jesus. He undergirds us with his help and strength through the storms of life. So when we go to the throne of grace, that's the kind of help we get. This, this help that holds everything together in a time of need. Like the ropes held the wood planks of the ship together in the storm-tossed sea. So church, when our world is falling apart or seems to be falling apart, the promise here is, the promise, the sure promise is, we will find the grace and mercy we need in our time of need. When we go to the throne of grace, he is there ready, able, and willing to give us the help we need in the moment we need it. The CEV puts it, so whenever we're in need, we should come bravely before the throne of our merciful God. There will be treated with undeserved kindness, and we will find help, timely help, the right help, available to us through prayer. That's why we sang those songs this morning about going to the Lord in prayer and needing Him, because it's through access to the throne of grace by Jesus, our high priest, that He gives us the help we need. It's there for the asking. And church, this is good news. <laughs> because we need more help than we realize. Our time of need certainly includes times of testing, times of trial, times of hardship, times of pain, times of difficulty. We more readily recognize our need for help in those times. But guess what? As we sang this morning, every hour we need him. Every moment we need him. For our everyday lives, we need him. We need him in everyday responsibilities that we give ourselves to. 
like at work. We need him at work. We need his strength. We need him to give us the, the, uh, the grace to humbly interact with other people. We need him at school and in our studies and in our interactions with other students. We need him in our everyday responsibilities. We need him in the hours of alone time at, at home when nobody else is around. We need him in our spiritual disciplines. We need his help to give us that hunger to seek him and to be with him. We need his help in marriage and in child rearing, in the everyday routines, in everything we need him and the help only he can supply. Not just in the difficulties, but every hour, every moment. Annie Hawks, the writer of the lyrics of the hymn, I Need Thee Every Hour, that we sang this morning, shares the inspiration for the song. She says, one day as a young wife and a mother of 37 years of age, I was busy with the regular household task during a bright June morning in 1872. Suddenly I became so filled with the sense of the nearness of the master that wondering how one can live without him, either in joy or pain, these words were ushered into my mind and the thought at once took full possession of me. I need thee every hour. She even included that other line in the song, in joy or in pain. I need thee every hour. The chorus of the hymn finishes with the invitation that our verses here in Hebrews actually give. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying. Come to the great high priest. Come to the throne of grace and find the grace and mercy you need in your time of need. It's available to you. Come, come to him. Come, every moment, if need be. Tom Long adds, the preacher warns them to move past, or wants them to move past fearful prayers, tidy prayers, formal and distant prayers, toward a way of praying with honest and heartfelt cries of human need. He does not want them to pray like bureaucrats seeking a permit, but like children who cry out into the night, trusting that they will be heard and comforted. And in fact, church, that's exactly how Jesus prayed to the Father. Look at chapter 5 now, verses 7 through 10. During, his days of, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from when he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who believed and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. The fervent cries and tears indicate that Jesus was indeed subject to tests and temptations and trials and the human condition. Uh, this is further evidence to the Hebrews and to us that Jesus, this is evidence of Jesus' ability to sympathize with us as our great high priest. In other words, Jesus' status as the Son of God did not exempt him from suffering or make it easier for him in the suffering. He truly suffered pain. He truly cried out with heartache. He truly suffered physically he truly experienced hunger and thirst. He truly and literally died on the cross. Jesus knows all about our weakness. You see, Jesus is truly and fully God, but he is also truly and fully human. His loud cries and tears verify his humanity. In fact, the incarnation, Jesus coming into the flesh, into this world to live among us, is is a, is a demonstration of, to, to, of, of the extent Jesus would go to be and stand in solidarity with us. He became like us to redeem us. Leon Morris says, Jesus knows our human condition is not just something you heard about because he too knows about it. He, was a, he too was a man. The message puts these verses, so we don't have a high priest who is out of touch with our reality. No, Jesus, our high priest, cried out in pain. Right. Loud cries and tears, that's the, the uh, name of the sermon series during this season of Lent. 
They're not, uh, they're not surface level prayers. They're not generic prayers. His tears indicate great distress and anguish. And we're going to be looking at the instances in Jesus' life in the days of his flesh. He cried out in prayer, with, in prayer with loud cries and tears. We're going to look at some of the instances. But here, likely, it refers to Jesus at Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane. When he, when he pleads with the Father, and he prays to the Father, and weeps and cries, because the author of Hebrews adds, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Jesus had prayed in the garden, take this cup from me, but not what I want, but what you want, your will be done. Jesus prayed with loud cries and tears, but it ended with trust in God. What you want, Lord, your will be done. Jesus, Jesus, think about this, went to the Father in his time of need, so why wouldn't we? Jesus went to the Father when he needed help with this decision and grappling with it and the anguish of it and the distress of it. So why wouldn't we? Jesus went to the Father and he has given the strength to drink the cup of suffering. He's obedient to the point of death on the cross. And obedience is one of the, 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 the fruits of, of trusting God. Trusting him. Well, someone might ask, well, how was he heard? Because he still had to die. How was he heard? He wasn't saved from death. He had to, he had to die. Uh, that was just part of the prayer, remember. <laughs> Not what I want, but what you want. And he was heard because he was given everything he needed to go to the cross to fulfill the Father's will. In fact, that's the meaning of the word perfect there. Jesus was absolutely perfect as we understand it and was without sin. But, but this word here means that he accomplished the goal. It means that he brought it to completion. That he did everything the Father wanted him to do. And therefore became the source, the source, the only source of eternal salvation. And has become the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12 to, to teaches us. I didn't read these verses, but notice in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 5 that the Levitical priesthood offers sacrifices for the sins of the people. And we know from the rest of Hebrews that Jesus goes way beyond that and offers himself as a sacrifice for our sins and for all, all sins, once for all. So there's no needed uh, sacrifice or any other further offerings needed. He's the all-sufficient sacrifice and therefore the source of, it, of our of our salvation. Roger Hahn comments, the real point then is that the readers should not abandon their faith in Christ because of their suffering. After all, as their great high priest, Jesus could sympathize with them because he had already suffered. So with fairness, he could ask them to remain faithful because he also had learned obedience in his sufferings. In other words, church, times of hardship and suffering can give us further education in spiritual things. God can use those times in our lives to further conform us to the image of His Son. Can teach us a deeper trust in Him. It's not that we like it. It's not that we say, Oh God, please send me hardship because I want to learn more. No, no. It will come on its own. Hardship and, and difficulties and pain and suffering will come on its own. We don't have to ask for that. But the Lord can use those times to teach us. I've so appreciated Carletta's openness to allow the Lord to do such a work in her this past year. And with her permission, I reiterate what she's already told us. The transmission in her car went out last year around this time and she found out that she would have to replace the transmission a very expensive fix for which she didn't have the money for and she couldn't get another car because she was still making payments on the car that broke down so she has been without a car for a year now and this time has not been without its difficulties and tears she even told me that on the phone this last week. It's not been like an easy thing for her. There have been a lot of difficult times, a lot of praying, a lot of wondering, a lot of tears. But this 
This year has also deepened her walk in the Lord in ways that may not have happened otherwise. The resulting gratitude of the Lord's work in her heart is evident. She's expressed thanks that this year has been an opportunity to learn patience. <laughs> My grandmother told me that she prayed four or five times for patience and every time she had another kid. It's not <laughs> You might not, you might not need to, you don't need to pray for patience, Father. Opportunities, opportunities will come as well. But she has, yeah, but she has given witness that the Lord, the Lord used this as a way to teach her patience and a deeper trust in the Lord. And you know what? The Lord has come through. The Lord has provided for her. Joyce and Sandra are among others who gave rise to Carletta, sure. to church, and Shirley, and to, to the store, and to appointments, and she's just expressed her greater gratitude for such a great church family. And then in the midst of this, unbeknownst to her, there was some insurance payments due to her mother who had passed, who were now due to her, her closest uh, relative, which is Carletta. And did you know that it is more than enough money to pay for the new transmission? More than enough. In fact, the car is now there at the dealership getting repaired or waiting for the repairs to be done. But do you see the, 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 the providence of God here? The goodness of God's timing? She didn't get this money three years ago when she didn't have the need or the problem. She got it in the exact time she needed it, church. More than enough money to pay for this repair in the exact timing. Do you see the goodness of God? Do you see the goodness of God in her and for her and through her? And for many others, you see, it's, it has a trickle-down effect on us. The goodness of God and the mercies of God extend to other people. And he starts to invite other people to be part of it. And Cardaletta can tell you that she has found the help and the grace and the mercy she needed in her time of need. When her car is fixed, she gets it back. She's determined to help as many people as she can, she told me. She wants to do for others what others have done for her. Thanks be to God. So church, don't lose heart. Don't grow weary. The Lord won't let anything that happens in our lives go to waste. He can use it for our benefit. He will teach us and transform us through the hardships, and the Lord gives us everything we need to remain faithful to Him, even in times of distress, even in times of hardship, even when we also cry out to God with our own cries for mercy and help. When the old order of things passes away, there will be no tears, we are promised in Revelation 21 4, but until then, we have our great high priest who gives us access to the throne of grace to find the grace and mercy that we need in our time of need. Jesus, who himself offered up in prayer loud cries and tears, and who now and forever intercedes for us and invites us to come to him moment by moment to find the help we need. If the musicians would come this morning, the invitation then is to do just what the author of Hebrews tells us to do, to approach the throne of grace, to find the mercy and grace that we need in our time of need, to, uh, to offer up honest prayers of the heart. And maybe it will include even this morning loud cries to the Lord and, and tears to the Lord, pouring our hearts out to Him. But as the, the song that we're going to sing says, come and tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He can help you. He will help you. <laughs>